thank you very much for the invitation to be here. I, I, I very much want to focus on what Mark has just said around the um, politics, in my mind, being at the very heart and soul of media studies as a subject. And in many ways, a heart and soul that's been rather neglected in certain ways. And I see that, I mean, not only in the research that goes on in media studies, but also in the way that we teach media studies to a certain extent. Uh, and I see media studies as very much thinking through the politics, prospects, and problems of our times. And I, I think that, to me, is one of the reasons why I came into the field itself. And I can't, I can't do anything else but do that within, um, the, within my department and the way I work. But I, I also think it, uh, what I want to do is kind of a pitch for putting that at the heart of everything else as well. And I want to relate this to some of the conference themes of what it means to learn and teach in the digital age, uh, in particular in relation to this thing called communicative freedom that is supposed to be uh, you know, at, at, at our fingertips in the digital age and how we begin to think and critique and understand and share that with our students. But also the role and purpose of media education. And I'm going to talk about that in very much in it, around the notion of power and where power adheres and how we can challenge power in different ways. And then about the relationship between theory and practice. I've just come out of two days' worth of, and you very rarely hear this phrase, the most inspiring departmental meetings <laughs> you can imagine. And that was partly because we were there interrogating this relationship between theory and practice and seeing how we can make those two really um, flourish as a synergy together. And, and that was uh, really because came out of everybody in the department with a firm belief that theory is practice and practice is theory. They both create and challenge forms of knowledge in, uh, in everything that they do. Uh, practice is also not just about making stuff. Well, it was very clear in what we were saying. It's also about doing stuff. And in that doing stuff, I also think that relates to the stuff I do around campaigning and media reform. And that I see as media practice. That is me taking the work that I do from a very firm premise in the research that I undertake and actually saying, right, I'm taking it out there and practicing what I do and what, what I research. So it, it's, for me, I see this as a, you know, as a real sort of um, blurring complexity and richness that comes out of our field that relates directly to those, the three things in the title that I want to talk to today, publics, politics and power. And of course, whenever you talk about those things, what you have to talk about, or to me, is an immediate sort of um, quick step into talking about the relationship between media and democracy. And I, I, again, find it very hard these days to think about anything related to mediated practice, whatever that is, without thinking about what does this mean for society? What does this mean? for individuals trying to work together to emerge as publics? What does it mean for our political relationships with each other and with the, uh, with the polity? What does that then mean for democracy? So all of those things, I think, are at the forefront of everything I do, and I think it actually need to emerge much more from very many other aspects of our field. And that whole relationship between media and democracy has been thrust into the limelight in recent times. I mean, the media as a subject has never been more central to the news and, and sort of, you know, public discussion, not least with the phone hacking scandal with Leveson. You know, I, I can't believe, and this is partly, of course, because I'm obsessed with it and I read every single piece of news that comes out on it, but I, it's never a day goes by when there's not at least five pieces in national media relating to phone hacking or Leveson in some way, shape, or form, sometimes much more than that. Not necessarily what I'd like to hear being said in the media, but an awful lot of content itself, a sheer mass that has thrown media into the forefront of public issues. BBC, payoffs of senior executives at the BBC, one of which happens to be my boss. 
You know, so that's, you know, the, again, right at the forefront of what we do. The Twitter abuse of Caroline um, Criado Perez, remember that back in June, uh, July time? Somebody who campaigned for the simple right of women to be on UK banknotes, which was then came under massive abuse and tyranny through Twitter, actually, um, by misogynists for months and months and months. And then another, of course, very much at the forefront, Ed Snowden and the internet-enabled surveillance operations through the NSA and GCHQ. So the media, in all uh, of its kind of messy glory, is very much at the centre of news, more than ever before, more than I can remember for a long time in many ways. So that debate over whether or not and in what form the media are related to the practice of democracy, and notice I say the practice of democracy, is raging and rightly so. Yet too often this thing called democracy and attempts to understand the role of the media in democratic life I think really belies complexity. And this is where our emphasis as teachers and educators comes in because I think that critical perspective that we should be bringing to bear is crucial in understanding what this relationship might mean and unravelling it. We're frequently told that one leads to the other. So in one formulation, a free media are seen as a prerequisite um, for democracy to flourish. But here, an ill-used but often used interpretation of freedom of the press is employed to defy explanation and justify most anything. Who can be against freedom, particularly freedom of the press, when the press have such a crucial relationship with a healthy democracy? And you get this kind of knee-jerk response, um, very prevalent in the UK right now, but also uh, elsewhere, that draws on this common sense relationship, but is often no more than a cheap disguise for the promotion of free market capitalism, which is then seen as leading us on this kind of direct path to democratization, which is actually on the gravy train of commercial media. Alternatively, it's proposed that freedom as this kind of free floating concept, more generally connected in this instance to democracy, and most often Western forms of capitalist democracy, of course, will inevitably lead to a free media. But once more, dig a little deeper, and that free media is largely construed as media free at the point of profit. And one of the things I think we really have to challenge is how can media be other things as well? You know, this whole notion getting people to conceive of working together differently, being together differently in social groups, creating media together differently is also really key to our practice. This freedom achieved, is achieved via capitalism and democracy is achieved via the market. So you just get this, and we all know this, trotted off um, very regularly from many aspects of the mainstream media. And those approaches present a very media deterministic point of view. But they then allow a type of logic that supports arguments that then say that can be used or trotted out in relationship to the internet as having this inherent, liberating and democratising impact. Regardless of the actual content or the broader context of which they're a part. So media freedom, in other words, finds itself morphed from an extremely complex um, concept into a very simplistic notion that actually assumes a, a very clear level of normativity developed um, with a highly seductive common sense relationship to this thing called liberal democracy. And I, you know, I stress the liberal because I'm not entirely sure where that fits in with where we are right now. To have one must be to have the other, thereby denying this more critical interpretation of its contemporary translation which I would hesitate to call liberal. Now, what such approaches, I think, fail to do, and again, this is a plea for our pedagogy, how we approach the teaching of media, is that the existing the relationship between media and democracy depends on very many things. It depends on the existing state of the media. Let's critique and analyse that first. It depends on the existing state of the market 
and how that relates to the media, and indeed on the state of actually existing democracy in every context, not just on this vague notion of what democracy might be. How is it being practiced right now? What are the problems with the form of democracy that we're practicing right now, and how does the media relate to that? Where context, this developed context, is likely to be state-led because of the prevailing nature of state legislators, not least under things like media reform and media policy and the regulation of news that we're talking about now, but also not state-bound due to globalisation, and hence the complexity of that argument when you come to talking about the internet. So the relationship depends on political culture and media policy. Now that sounds so simple, doesn't it? But how often do we really put that at the heart and soul of what we're talking about? It depends on the nature of the economy and the market. I can't start my teaching now without actually making sure first that students actually understand what's going on in the economy and know how markets work or don't work. That's crucial to everything that we do. It depends on media and communication technologies and formats, but as well as social and cultural issues, such as poverty, such as literacy, such as religious differences, such as daily rituals. All of those things will affect uh, the, the production of media content, it will affect media circulation, and it will affect media consumption. All of those things together are relevant to everything that we teach. And they will influence how and to what extent democracies can function effectively in uh, mediated worlds. The study of media then, after I've gone through all of that, is, of course, directly related to power. And if, you know, if I want to get one thing across in everything that I teach is, you've got to understand power. And certainly, the stuff that I've been doing over the last couple of years has, um, and, and I talk about that as media practice, and that's in the media campaign work that I've been doing, has made me understand power far better than I ever have before. And I see that, again, as action research that feeds into my writing and into my teaching, directly into my teaching. So we need to understand the power of the message makers, the power of the decision makers, and the power of publics to participate in these processes. This is what media studies is about to me. It's understanding power is at the heart of the purpose of media education. And what I want to spend a bit of time doing now is actually talking about that in relation to the example of news and Leveson. Um, talking, again, from a kind of a personal perspective, drawing on research that was the reason I got involved in the first place. So when the whole stuff came out about phone hacking, I sat around a table um, having a cup of coffee with Des Friedman and James Curran in the department, and we kind of sighed and looked at each other and said, God, you know what, now we've got to do something. <laughs> We're sitting on all this research that has, brings an explanatory framework that we think challenges the current context. We've been writing about it, we've been talking about it. We actually really can't not do anything, can we? And it was that, you know, we've, since then, um, you know, our lives have gone from mad to manic. But, but I would never, ever not have done it. Because that has been, and, and the teaching that we've been able to do on the back of that work has been, I think, some of the most exciting and engaging teaching we've ever done in, in the department in relation to um, political communication in particular. So if we talk through complex relations as an, you know, just want to think through that power, publics, politics, in relation to news media, which of course are given a very particular relevance in relation to media and democracy and citizen participation. News provides, or at least should provide, in its ideal formation, the vital resources for processes of information gathering, deliberation and analysis that enables democracy to function. 
In an ideal world unfettered by commercial pressures of failed business models, new technology and plummeting sales and circulation figures, that would mean that news media survey the political environment, hold the government and officials to account, provide a platform for illuminating and intelligible debate, and also encourage dialogue across a very diverse range of views. But that is very much ideal, and it's hinged on a conception of independent journalism in the public interest, linked to notions of knowledge, political participation, and democratic renewal. Now, of course, you can't understand the whole basis of what news and journalism is without interrogating those terms. But we also know, and this again came out of a long um, research project with many people in the department, that news media have been beset with very many challenges over the last decade that have introduced considerable stress lines to those ideals. So in a corporate world, it's now difficult to maintain profit margins and shareholder returns unless you employ fewer journalists. Employing fewer journalists um, in a context where you have to fill more space means doing everything on a much sort of quicker and shallower basis. So we get to that view of journalism that has been uh, now so commonly understood, the cut and paste administrative journalism that actually delivers a, a, a homogeneity of content rather than a diversity of content in the end. And if you combine that faster and shallower corporate journalism of the digital age with the need to pull in readers for commercial rather than journalistic reasons, it's not actually difficult to see how the traditional values of professional journalism can be very quickly cast aside in order to indulge in sensationalism, dealing gratuitous spectacles and dubious emotionalism. Set that alongside the fact that in, in many places there's an ever smaller number of global media institutions dominating the media landscape, that old debate around media concentration that is ever more relevant, then the simple notion that media, more media, means better democracy starts to look rather tenuous. The larger and more concentrated media empires become, the more concerned politicians are to maintain good relations with owners and senior executives and editors. And the Leveson Enquiry website, with all of people's evidence there for everyone to use and see, has never been a better pedagogic tool. It is astonishing. There is so much evidence in that report that is immediate and direct that, you can, that, that students can use as a fantastic data source. You know, it's just go out there, read it, use it, see what people have said. You know, I, I'm very aware that not everybody followed obsessively everything that went on, but it's all there. And it's the most brilliant um, tool if you use it in the, in the right way. So what we found with political parties, the police, other institutions have actually been very reluctant to investigate wrongdoing in the news media. They've been very reluctant to hinder the expansion of media empires and um, conglomerates or introduce new regulation of news organisations and journalistic practice. Why? Because of the power of those organisations and the fear, the real fear in politicians of what will happen if they do challenge. And those threats are, believe me, are very, very real. And it doesn't just result in them tending to leave alone certain organisations and people. It also results in, our, in it impacting directly on the areas of public policy that they will focus on. And research, again, um, I point to my colleague Aaron Davis's work here, is, has been very crucial in showing that um, to us. So Hackgate reveals the mechanisms of a system based, I would say, very firmly on the corruption of power. It's not the kind of distortion of a functional system, which is how the media would like us to see it. It's part and parcel of a system that's fully integrated into neoliberalism. Phone hacking didn't just happen because those who did it kind of knew they could get away with it 
and it was a business risk worth taking. You know, actually, the payouts we'll have to make when we have to go through the courts won't, you know, the, the balance of the money we'll make on those newspaper sales make it worth doing. It wasn't just that. And in fact, many editors, of course, denied that they had any knowledge and continue to deny of illegal practice uh, occurring. The problem is much, much broader and deeper than that would tend to suggest. It's not just about ethical practice which again is how it tends to get framed. It's to do with the system of news production that they were part of. The power system is very crucial to that. It's complex. It involves the increasing entanglement of political and media elites as news coverage takes on an ever more important role in um, policy making and elections. It's about the failure of the Press Complaints Commission to uphold ethical standards and enable adequate self-regulation alongside the broken business model of newspapers with plummeting circulation and readership figures. But one thing is clear, that illegal practice of phone hacking didn't have the primary motive of the press as fourth estate holding truth to power. In a thoroughly marketized and deregulated newspaper industry, the mission was all about gaining competitive advantage. There's some lovely quotes through the Leveson data that shows that, you know, the, um, I'm trying to think who it was now, um, um, Thingy Cavanna from The Sun, what's his first name? P, P, is it Peter? Peter Cavanna from The Sun? Trevor, Trevor, it's Trevor. Trevor, how could you forget Trevor? Trevor Cavanna from The Sun who says, you know, don't be ridiculous, news is a business just like any other business. It's got nothing to do actually with this grand mission of um, being the fourth estate. And that tells us we need to understand what that business is and what it's, you know, how this marketization of news has come about and where the, what the history of that is. So a media system that may have many platforms and points of distribution, but it's dominated by very few powerful voices, and a news media increasingly run to secure financial reward or political influence, again, very key. There's a lovely tweet that um, Lebedev said after his evidence to Leveson, that said, oops, forgot to tell Leveson that you can't expect uh, media owners to put in millions of pounds and then not have political influence or influence over political leaders or something. It was like, <laughs> oops. You know, it, it was kind of this, this is just expected. It's entitled, it's what we are entitled to in these roles. So that complex of politics and power is very clearly unlikely to foster greater political participation, a better political culture, very unlikely to reap a healthy democracy. Now, we know that the practice of phone hacking has been widely condemned, but we also know that the common response from the news industry has been direct responsibility towards the law and inadequate policing claiming that it's not the concern of the media industry, but rather a result of failures in criminal investigations and prosecutions. The solution, therefore, is with the police and the law. It's got nothing to do with further regulation of the profession. The industry should be free to do whatever it pleases. And freedom, in this sense, becomes a simple narrative device to sidestep the deeper systemic problems of the newspaper industry of which these ethical misdemeanors are actually just one symptom. Freedom of the press stands in for all activities of the press, regardless of whether they have democratic intent or not. So any form of regulation that may encourage news organisation to behave in particular ways is assumed to be detrimental to democracy. Statutory regulation of any kind in relation to the press becomes nothing more than state censorship. So there we get this direct relationship coming back to us, that relationship between journalism and democracy as being causal. One thing leads to the other. You start, you just you try and put some limits and boundaries around journalism and you immediately damage democracy. So you get into this common sense assumption. The more news we have, the more democratic our societies are. The less news we have, the less democratic we are. Abundance comes to stand in for pluralism, and then that comes to stand in for freedom in the very same breath. But we know, and this is the, uh, actually a quote that 
I keep repeating now because the Daily Telegraph, it was a quote the Daily Telegraph used to show how much I embodied professor of evil in their, in, in, in their eyes. And, but, and this was the quote, and it's quite interesting to think of it uh, when it was taken out of context. Democracy is far more than the quantity of news. You know, yes, okay. It's, it's so many, this is the bit they didn't say, <laughs> so many so-called developed democracies have a plethora of news media, yet a public sphere that is severely impoverished. You know, it's like, okay, you know what, what you're just saying pluralism, more equals better. Freedom, tick, more democracy. You know, what does that mean? How can we begin to interrogate those terms? More news clearly doesn't necessarily help democracy, even if consumption is high, if the nature of news content serves the interests of the news industry over and above the public's information needs. In such cases, contemporary coverage can actually lead to a mood of anti-politics, and the work of Stephen Coleman is really instructive here. It can thwart political participation in the public sphere, and diminish democracy. But try telling those with power that giving them more power is anti-democratic, and that tirade of abuse is really quite astonishing. And it always pivots on this relationship between freedom, the media, and democracy. The tabloid press in particular throw, have thrown their might and megaphone behind a campaign designed to claim freedom as their right to publish whatever they like in the pursuit of profit a response that equates markets to freedom, to democracy, and any regulation to its antithesis. So what I think we're seeing in this interpretation of notion of the freedom of press is actually the appropriation and incorporation of a progressive concept into a particular political economic system. That term, freedom of the press, has actually become a term emptied of its real meaning, and Hart and Negri have a nice phrase here, where they, which they call false universals that characterise dominant modern rationality. And they are really nice, it's a really nice phrase to think about in terms of teaching. What are those terms? How are we trapped within and, and, and sort of struggle to find alternative ways of interpreting what that might be? It's a really important role that we have as media educators. In its neoliberal translation, media freedom is part of a system that tells us productivity is increased, innovation unleashed, if the state stays out of the picture and lets businesses get on with it. Productivity in the market, and hence news as a commodity, takes precedence over those social and political concerns of news as a mechanism of democratic process. In other words, the less so-called interference in the form of regulation, the more liberalised the market, the better the outcome. And this is where I think we are getting to in our um, theorising and discussions of what it might mean to take democracy forward, how we might counter some of that free market rationality that we, that, that we actually found ourselves in a position after all the financial crisis of going, you know what, what is the alternative? Where are we going? And we were bereft of alternatives. Why? Because I think as an academy, we didn't really focus and interrogate what those alternatives might be and how we could claim that and push it forward. So to me, those demonstrations of freedom of the press, the tool of freedom of the press as a sort of teaching enabler, really, it reminds me of Wendy Brown talking about the extent to which basic principles and institutions of democracy are becoming nothing more than ideological shells concealing their opposite. And I think we could do far worse than actually going back to really teaching hardcore ideology and, and really focusing back in on those terms and debates, which uh, you know, I think we will have a return to very much in, in, recent, in the near future. So those ideological shells which conceal their opposite, things like moralities, freedom, democracy, that have been displaced by this thoroughgoing market rationality, how do we do that? How do we pick them apart? Brown notes under neoliberalism, we're kind of left with these residues of old-fashioned democracy inside the legitimation project of neoliberalism one that conducts and legitimates itself on different grounds from liberal democracy, 
even as it doesn't immediately divest itself of the name. It's a facet of this transition, Brown argues, that poses a problem for critics attuned to representative democracy's shortcomings. So we want to say there's something wrong with this thing we're calling democracy, but we don't know where to go to find it. So pointing out ways in which questions of freedom and democratic principle are impugned or hypocritically transgressed actually is of little effect because they've come to mean something else. And political reasons and reasoning that exceed or precede neoliberal criteria have actually ceased to matter much. So we have then a responsibility to change that, to turn that round, to find and interrogate those principles and approaches. But don't worry, it's all going to be absolutely fine. Democracy's flourishing because, hey presto, we have the internet. And that's where we get to. These are the debates that you go in. I'm in public debates probably two or three times a week at the moment, where that's where we're led. You know, but no, don't be ridiculous. Of course everything's fine. We've got the internet. Everything's possible. You can find out everything. The world is surely our information oyster. We, have, we are free at last. We have deliverance via the internet. Now, I, I haven't got that much time to talk through all the details of that debate, but it, it hinges around that notion that information pluralism is foregrounded as the means to communicative and democratic freedom. And there are exactly the same arguments around power and, and, and also to do with politics, but also to do with social practice that are key in terms of the internet. So as if we actually pick apart those terms that are thrown at us by the likes of Castells as creative autonomy, or uh, uh, you know, sort of Benkler's very seminal work that tells us that democracy is radically altered because of the internet. If we dig a little deeper on that, we'll find that the limitless plurality on offer is challenged by other social factors. And this is where I come to, you know, in lots of media studies, there's the missing social and the forgotten political, I think. Research we know on the digital divide notes that internet users are still younger, more highly educated and richer than non-users. They're still more likely to be men than women. This is a global analysis and more likely to live in cities. Those concerns don't just refer to the internet and huge gaps between global north and south, but they also refer to online activity within developed nations and to traditional divides, and this is crucial actually, between well-educated middle class who dominate public discourse ever more because of the internet, actually, and those on the peripheries who are excluded altogether. Plurality, or at least the ability to take advantage of plurality, is actually reserved for the privileged. And we could talk through also many things related to, um, in, in that context, related to news and how plurality of news online is also highly limited by studies of how that news is actually consumed and what's done with it. So if we really want to understand this relationship between media and this thing called democracy, I think we actually have to ask uh, some different questions. We have to ask some, or maybe go back to the old questions. We have to start thinking about you know, how network communication of the internet has integrated people better into politics, has it? Has it really made public politics administer against inequality? Has it made centres of economic power politically accountable? Then I would argue precisely the reverse. In many countries with two or three decades now of neoliberalism, which arguably have eroded the integration of trust networks, increased, and this is unarguable, inarguable, increased inequality, and increase the autonomy of corporations through deregulation and liberalisation in a digital age where media usage is ever more assiduously and frighteningly surveyed, monitored and monetized. So where does this leave us as media educators? If we take the role of the media in society seriously, as surely if we must, if nobody else does, then we have to seek to understand the social dimensions of political life and citizenship to actually know, I want to know what brings people together and why do they seek solidarity? You know, what does that? How can we actually 
think that through politically. The political can't be understood outside of relations of power or without the social. And only when we have a sense of what may constitute the political, economically, socially and technologically, alongside a better understanding of the nature of power therein, and can interpret those factors through a, a particular socio-geographic lens, so not assume generalizability, only then can we begin to address the part played by the internet and its role in the complexity of modern day living. And I think if we are really talking about politics and democracy, whichever way you choose to see it, democratization requires the real and material participation of the oppressed and those who have been excluded in the past and the victims of those political systems. Political participation is not about access, although that's important. It's not about voice, the new word, although that's important. But ultimately, participation is about limiting the control of a few privileged people or dominant corporations who rule. Now, I'm going to finish up about, again, coming back round to that notion of power. Because, of course, and what media studies does in these conversations, you know, how we, I mean, you know, I start with my research by saying all we can ever do is hope to contribute to the public conversation can ever do is sort of present the work and hope that this is taken up in some way, shape or form. And of course, corporations, even on that um, very humble premise, are never going to like it very much when we do that. And certain elements of the media would much rather we didn't consider power. Far better, far more convenient for them that we actually totally ignored it and allowed them to evermore gather it. Power, far too frequently, I think, um, now in very many discourses, in all types of discourses, and academic as well as media, um, sort of mainstream media, disappears in a puff of smoke disguised as communicative freedom. And it's kind of an overhang, I think, from postmodernism of that, you know, we're all in this, we've all, all this stuff is out there, we can all do it, it's all, you know, and that's what freedom is. And actually, if we, if the recent crisis has taught us anything, I think we should really be clear that it's actually um, taught us that power is vital and is um, in, in, in here and structured and cultured in so many ways in society that we need to understand that before we can even begin to talk about what freedom might be. And I still don't know what that might be. So, to end, surely the purpose of media studies is to open up the production and circulation of social meaning to critique. And who has the power to actually decide what that social meaning, or to get the first imprint of what that social meaning should be? We should be tracing its history, theorising its power, calculating its destructiveness, and then seeking to change it, whether through our own media practice, our own creativity, our own campaigns, which I still would come back to calling my own media practice. Media and communication studies should always be critical. It should always encompass that politics problems and prospects of our times. I think we've been far too reluctant as academics to talk about prospects, talk about future thinking. What might things be? How might things be better? We're very good at critiquing the present and the past. What might we think the future could look like? And in my experience, students find that incredibly exciting and interesting work to do. So if we value media education and learning as a public good, if we value media education as a route to social justice, if we value media education as simply a means to understanding and probably the greatest um, endeavour of all, then we must put public's politics and power at the very heart of our pedagogy. Thank you for listening.